All right, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> thank you very much for coming out in our gale here this evening. A little water over the top of the breakwater, exciting to see. I always like to see that, but uh, yeah, hopefully everyone's power will be back on when they get home. Uh, if your power is out, they're working on it, I'm sure. So this is the second part, was well, transvaluation of all values, that's the series. I'm doing a little three-part seg segment within that called You Are Not a Slave. And last time I asked you to pay attention to your use of the phrase, I have to, as opposed to saying, I want to, or I will it so. Um, and just so you know that I try and do all the things I recommend that you do, I said to somebody, I have to go to the coffee shop. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, oh, there it is. What an absurd, what a ridiculous concept. I have to go to the coffee shop. You can practically not restrain me from going to the coffee shop. <laughs> Joe, it's tried. It doesn't work. I mean, it is, it's, um, but this, this notion that everything we do, we try to ascribe to outside necessity. <clears throat> it's not us. It's something outside of us that forces us to do what we're doing, even when it's something that we want to do very much, that we prefer to do, that we like to do. <clears throat> and so that was uh, the first part of You Are Not a Slave. The second part this evening is uh, play, not work. And I, and I want to focus on this because I think of all the things that we tell ourselves the one I hear the most is, <clears throat> I have to work. I have to work. I have to make a living. A guy's got to make a living. A person has to make a living. So just to be clear, you do not have to make a living. No one cares whether or not you make a living, besides you, perhaps. The universe doesn't care. In a, in a couple of billion years, the sun is going to begin to expand and burn the earth into a cinder. You don't have to make a living. Also, statistically, if you look at the chart here on the labor force participation rate, labor force participation rate is just the number of all possible workers, 16 years and older, who are working. Uh, right now, our labor force participation rate is at a pretty close to record highs at around 63%. What this means is 37% of the people in our country do not work. Join them. You don't have to make a living. <laughs> Feel free. Also, anybody who's under 16 doesn't count. So roughly half the population of our country isn't working anyway. Join them. You do not have to make a living. But what we tell ourselves is I have to make a living when what we really mean is I prefer the life that I lead when I have money and am, have a job and am working to make money and advance myself. This is the, but that core lie is I have to do it. No, we love to do this. So it's play, not work. If you look at kids, they're active. Any healthy young person wants to do things. What you have to do is train them not to. This is why we give them drugs, Ritalin and all the rest of that stuff. Because they're too active. They're disruptive. Healthy kids want to do things. Any healthy human being wants to do something. Now, that drive to activity, which it varies. What we want to do, hugely variable. Some people want to read, some people want to build stuff, some people want to swim, some people want to play with animals. I mean, it's just, just the, the, the diversity of human desire for occupation and pastime is, is, is immense. It's wonderful. It's splendid. But the notion that we have to do something, see, reverses the order of things. We desperately desire to do things. But our culture tells us over and over again that you must do. And it tries to narrow down that focus into a few channels and then say, oh, these are things you have to do. And then we use this as an excuse in many ways, which we'll talk about. But most of us want to earn a living because we like the things that come with that. Not least, we like to do things. We prefer to do things. And so we're happy to go out 
and work generally to, 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 to bring in money that allows us to do other things. This is a great deal if we think about it the right way. But what's happened is we've in, taken on the slave mentality, which has a lot of parts to it. The first part of the slave mentality, or one part of it, is simply the I must. Once you say that, oh, now you're giving up your power. You're, you're giving it over to your employer. One of the phrases I love is firing my boss. You don't quit, you fire your employer. Take the power to you. It's your power, you take it. Don't ascribe it to other people. And then because of this, we tend to put up with things at work that we don't need to unnecessarily. Often people take suffering and pain and stuff that's not, not being even put on them. They just take it on because they feel like that's part of the deal. If I'm not suffering and, and not really stressing or at least pretending to, then I'm not really quote unquote working. Yeah, we'll just call it play then. I've got to go play today. I have a play date at five o'clock to do what I want to do. And so we, we, we take on this guise of being oppressed. And again, it comes in a couple of parts. One part is, and one reason we love this guise, by the way, is it frees us from re responsibility. It's not my fault. It's not my choice. It's the external structure that's at work. I have to go places and do things, not because of me, but because of them, because of, if, of, of the structure in which I live, my employer, or my obligations, which come from apparently someplace else besides myself. So this is the great dodge of responsibility. This is beautiful, we love this. I would love to do this, but I have to work. I, my kids are the most important thing in my life. I wish I could spend more time with them, but I have to work. Right, which is to say, ah, oh, kids, holy shit, look at that, like, you know, just it's terrible. A couple, a couple of years ago, about a decade, I guess, there was a huge snowstorm in Washington, D.C., and no one could get to work in the whole Virginia, D.C. metroplex area for like a week to 10 days. And they said when they finally cleared the roads, everyone was like giddy to be back at work because they'd been stuck at home with their kids and their family and their husband and their wife for like seven days in a row. And they were suicidal. They're like, oh God, we're so happy to be back at work. Because secretly they really loved it. So one, it, it gives us this whole structure in which we don't have to make any decisions and we can abrogate personal responsibility, which we love. That's our step one. Step two is, I don't have to ask myself the internal question of what do I want to do? Ooh, because that's an evil question. If I have to ask myself what I want to do, and I can identify it, well, now I'm responsible, theoretically, for acting on it. And I can go, how does what I am doing line up with what I want to do? And so, this, so people get in there, and then, then they just, in this mindset again, of the slave. This is, this is me. I'm oppressed. And if you ask people, well, what do you want to do? They say, oh, I don't want to do anything. See, that not doing anything is the slave's dream. If you're impelled always to do things you don't want to do, not doing them makes sense. But that's not us. And yet we still dream, the dream in theory is, oh, I'm just going to lay on a tropical beach for apparently ever. If, if that is your dream, you, you're sick. This is, you are a sick human being. Now, it is not wrong to want a break and to go on a tropical beach and lay there for a finite amount of time. That's great. But most people would slowly go insane in that environment. You, most people, 99% of people, would be wildly unhealthy for them to do nothing but lay on a beach, besides the whole sun exposure thing. Even if you have an infinite amount of sunscreen, it's still not good for you. Because people want to be active. We want to do things. We want to make, we want to create, we want to express, we want to have experiences. <clears throat> but once we've trained ourselves into thinking that doing is bad and we don't like it and we're suffering, then we think naturally enough that, oh, not doing. That's liberation. That's freedom. That's what I really want. Again, that's different from saying I want to take a break. I've been doing things I like. Now I'm tired. I want to take a break. Perfectly reasonable. 
But to just say, oh, if you didn't have to work, what would you do? Lay on a beach. For how long could you take it? I recommend people run this experiment. If you're still on the college or school schedule, this is great because you can run this experiment every summer. And often people just, you know, students just go crazy. They're like, it's great for about three weeks, then I'm just bored, and so then I get drunk and light things on fire. And that was not very smart, but it was fun, and then school started, and that was kind of a relief, right? If you remember when you were a kid, right, sort of summer, yay! And then when school started, it was sort of like, oh, okay, good. You didn't want to admit that. You didn't want to say, you know, really, I'm kind of the structure, and it's helpful. But we like structure, by the way. <clears throat> so that ability or desire to avoid having to address both ourselves and to admit externally that, that probably we're not as unhappy as we often claim makes us abrogate our own power and responsibility. And so this leads to resentment, by the way. So people resent their employers. Now, resentment is just you hating on you. Your employer doesn't care if you resent them. You care if you resent them. It's just you, it's you fighting with you. And the reason you resent it is because you know this doesn't have to be this way. You're, you can feel that tension in yourself. You're fighting with you. That's resentment. And you can see this in all kinds of structures. And the example I want to use is Walmart, just because they're the largest employer in the United States. They're also a notoriously evil employer. So a notoriously evil employer is also the largest employer in the United States. I think that's hilarious. People cannot be deceived when they apply for a job at Walmart. If they said, would you like to work at a notoriously evil place? People apparently say, why, yes, I would. So we'll talk about why that is. But so they go to work there. And as an example of how this works is over the last decade, Walmart has been found guilty in court of several billion dollars in wage theft amongst every other kind of violation. Now that's what they've been found guilty of in court. This is a very difficult thing to prove. So how many total billions they've stolen, God only knows, but it's a lot. They've stolen billions and billions and billions of dollars from their employees. Well, how does this work? Well, because the employees feel small and threatened, they know they're being screwed, but they're fearful. And so they don't feel like they can do anything. And then their managers, who know they're screwing them and probably getting screwed themselves, are fearful. And so they feel like they have to do it even though they don't want to. And then the store manager feels the same way. Oh, if I don't do this to my employees, which I don't want to do, but I have to feel the district manager. And it goes all the way up. This is the problem with the slave mentality. You, no matter where you go on the chain, it's, 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 everyone is responding to the same sense of, oh, I have to do this evil, you know, stealing, robbing thing, or else the people above me. Until you get to the very top, look at the Walton family. So in theory, they're not slaves anymore, so we'll call them masters. This is master-slave dialectic. It's evil on both ends. So they have stolen individually, let's say, in the last 10 years, a billion dollars each from predominantly minimum wage workers. For some reason, they're not embarrassed to go out in public. They feel like this is great. But now imagine, imagine you're one of them. Imagine the mindset. You are a multi, multi, multi billionaire, one of the wealthiest people on the planet, and you still feel like you need to steal from minimum wage workers. So you're not free. You're a slave as much as the workers are a slave. You feel like you're desperately needing that money. What? But yes, this, what else could that somehow the next billion is going to really, really make the difference? <laughs> and you feel like you need to get the stock market returns that make the investors happy. So where is the win in any of this? Right? You have this vertically integrated slave mentality of, of, of fear. And maybe at the top, the masters are just totally nuts. And, and so that's, I mean, this is what happens, because if you're playing, this stuff is different. 
Um, and so that's what I want us to start thinking about. Is how do you break out of this cycle? Well, the first thing to note is you want to do things. So let's say you're in a place where Walmart really is the only gainful employment around, which is a lot of places. Walmart is in places where, okay, the economy is not doing so great. I want to make some money and do the... So first, um, I did the rough calculation. It's hard to get the number on employee theft from Walmart, but they're definitely way behind. <laughs> so employees, as far as I can tell, need to steal about four times as much shit from Walmart to catch up with the amount that Walmart is stealing from them. So if you work at Walmart, do the math yourself, have a TV. Uh, you know, and, and part of this, one way to approach this is then notice if your manager does something and says, screws you out of your brakes for a month. So now you've lost 10 or $12 worth of earnings because they keep taking this from you. But if you take a $100 TV, it's now funny that they're stealing $10 from you because you're stealing $100 from them. So this is fun because you think it's hilarious when they say, oh, we're shaving an hour off your work. You go, OK, that's a good deal. I'm happy. This is fun. See how much more fun that is? Because you're stealing so much from them than they're stealing from you. Now the power is the other way around. And you feel good about it. You feel like you're one of the Waltons. Right? Another way, perhaps if we don't want to go down the just steal stuff route, although I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure. The Waltons don't seem to be embarrassed. So you notice that. They are an, our society embraces them. They're amazing. They're wonderful. They're titans of industry. If you steal a $100 TV, you're an awful, terrible, rotten person. It's weird. See, that's a weird ethical thing. But another thing to do is just work less. Right? There's an old joke in, in for the former Soviet Union that went, oh, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. <laughs> right? And I think that's good. If you acknowledge this, if you know this is what you're doing and you can embrace it and feel good about it, well, then it's fun again. And when your manager says, oh, my goodness, none of these boxes got put away, you're like, oh, my gosh, you're right. <laughs> Look, they're still there. <laughs> Just like yesterday, they were there. Come back tomorrow. Let's see what happens. It's getting exciting. You know, I, that just sort of don't take, don't take it on. But we, you know, we have this notion of, you know, be a good worker, work hard, work hard and get ahead. What's a, what's a weird con? We don't say be a good player, play well, have fun, have fun today at work. We said, oh, we'll be a good worker. And on one hand, there is a joy in working well, being competent, achieving something, produce, producing, being part of a team, contributing. We love all that. Very human, I think very healthy. Ah, but if you're in a system where all those desires are perverted and, and robbed from you, then you need to be aware of this. You need to know, oh, this is not a reciprocal thing. They want me to be a good worker. They don't want to do anything. This is the confusion of the slave mind. A couple more suggestions I have. Uh, you could also um, just do your own work. Right? This is, this is key. So famously, I think it was Faulkner who was a night watchman at the University of Alabama. I think Alabama, right? Yes, University of Alabama, I believe. Uh, Mississippi? Mississippi? Mississippi, thank you, yes. University of Mississippi, Tuscaloosa. Right? Yeah, Tuscaloosa, thank you. Um, and he, he wrote his novels mm -hmm. in the night watchman shack. And I'm like, that is great. <laughs> right? I mean, it's bizarre to think about. Here's <laughs> Faulkner sitting in a shack at night as a night watchman. But what a great thing. How wonderful. He wasn't confused. What do you do at work? Oh, I love work. I go and write my novels. I mean, who knows what happened? I mean, obviously not doing a lot of night watching, but, but was writing spectacularly great novels. You know, there, you can do that, embrace it. But again, it's the clearing the mind and understanding. But if you're in a poisonous environment where you can't express yourself and you can't feel good about what you're doing, you can't feel that it's playful and feeds you, you probably just need to do something else. 
If it's not play at some level, you need to think about doing something else. And that's where you have to let go of that slave mindset. But I often think people, besides I often think we often lie to ourselves about how much we actually do like our work. Much of this I think is a pose. We're, we're perfectly pleased with what we're doing, or at least moderately pleased. And, and so we, we don't want to admit that. And it's just not as bad, but if you admit it, then you can say, oh, what's great about what I do at work? Did I do this? And what, what don't I like about this? Can I mitigate that? Can I, can I reduce this? Can I make it more tolerable? If I identify this, again, now you're taking responsibility. This is one problem. For making your life better. See, we don't want that. Oh, it's my employer's fault. Oh, you know, I have this problem, and oh, my boss, this and this. And, you know, did you ever mention it to them? Uh, no. Oh, why don't you mention it to them? And see if there's a possibility, not yell at them, just say, hey, is this possible to work? And if they go, sure, you're like, oh, huh, there you go. But again, it, you know, and part of what, another part of this is what prevents us is, again, the slave mindset is the fantasy of the perfect. Oh, I have this image, there are many of them that our culture sells us, of what the perfect life with the perfect job with everything exactly the way I want it to be, would be like. And as far as I can tell in history, this has never happened. The human condition is one of imperfection. It's embracing the necessary compromises and trade-offs that allow one to flourish in the human condition. It's not this, this, the seek for perf this seeking for perfection. is sort of, again, I think a mental, a mental illness. It's something an unrealistic and unhelpful ideal that, again, who has it? Who's ever had it? You know, people go, oh, I would love to have that life. And it's like, well, have you thought about what that life entails or what it took to get there? Do you want to make the trade-offs that they had to make to be in a position that you, you think might be great? And does it seem like you would enjoy it in a playful way? And we, and we struggle with this mightily. And I was trying to look for examples of this. And one is the great quote here from Willie Stargell. It's supposed to be fun. The man says play ball, not work ball. Play ball. It's supposed to be fun. Now, you know, they focus and they concentrate and all, but it's supposed to be fun. They're supposed to enjoy themselves. And we're suspicious of this. Right? That, 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 they, that this notion of, oh, make it fun. Emphasize the fun. I think it's articulated best. It's sort of a longish quote here from Nietzsche. <clears throat> but I think it really sums up where we've, where we've been going. Who's um, this author? Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Oh, Nietzsche. Yeah. Uh, all these heaviest things the load-bearing spirit takes upon itself. This is called the three transformations, by the way. And like the camel which, when laden, hastens into the wilderness, hastens into the spirit into the wilderness. So the first notion is, as Nietzsche ex extrapolates this, is look, we're strong like a camel. And so we take all these have-tos on top of us. And because we're strong, like, ooh, look, I can carry all these things. So that's the first transformation. We turn ourselves into a camel. And we're strong, and so we carry him out into the desert. And he says, when we get in the wilderness, um, the second metamorphosis, here the spirit becomes a lion. Freedom will it capture and lordship in its own wilderness. Its last lord it here seeks, hostile it will be to him, and its last god, for victory will it struggle with the great dragon. And the great dragon is thou shalt. So this lion comes along and says, I'm going to kill the camel that carries the burden. I mean, the camel is going to transform into this. And the way it does this is it has to fight the dragon of thou shalt. Thou shalt work. Thou shalt have a job. Thou shalt be responsible. Thou shalt support thyself. Thou shalt not be a burden on society. And you transform that into an I will. This is the concept that I was driving, driving, uh, driving at, going from I have to go to the coffee shop, 
See, that's the camel. I have to, I must, I have to, thou shalt, the great dragon. To, I want to go to the coffee shop. I will it so. That's the lion. And the lion has to kill the dragon so that it can put all this crap down that we've been carrying. Um, then he goes on, my bro- uh, uh, Verily there shall be no I will anymore. Thus speaks the dragon. So they fight. My brethren, wherefore is there the need of the lion and the spirit? Why suffice is not the beast of burden? To create new values that even the lion could not yet accomplish. But to create itself freedom for new creating that the lion can do. Now, this is interesting. His distinction here is he says, the lion has to come along to kill the dragon of thou shalt. But the I will, that drive, is not enough to create the new values, to create the new you. He says, to do that, to create itself freedom and give a holy nay unto duty, for that, my breath, and there is need of the lion. He creates the possibility to assume the ride to new values. That is the most formidable assumption for the load-bearing and reverent spirit. Verily, unto such a spirit it is praying and the work of a beast of prey. As its holiest, its once loved thou shalt now is forced to find illusions and arbitrariness even in the holiest things, that it may capture freedom from its love. The lion is needed for this capture. But tell me, my brethren, third transformation, what the child can do, which even the lion could not do. Why hath the prying lion still to become a child? Innocence in the child and forgetfulness, a new beginning, a game, a self-rolling wheel, a first movement, A holy yea. What the child can do is play. It makes itself a self-rolling wheel. A yea. A yea saying. A yes. To itself. To the world. To make it joyful. To make it fun. So that what it does, it transforms into play. Whatever it is that it does. And again, if you watch children, you must have noticed them do this. If you give them virtually anything to do, even if they fight you at first, once they get along with doing it, they almost immediately transform it into some kind of game. Often an unproductive and unhelpful game, but a game nonetheless. They transform virtually anything into play. And then they don't care what they're doing. Because it's play. And then they'll do that until they get bored and they want to do something else. Or until somebody gets hurt. (laughs) In which case they cry and they go, let's do something else. And then usually in like five minutes they're like, no, let's go back and do that thing that got hurt. That was actually fun. Right? That, That transformative power of play. So this, this, this notion of transformations, of transforming ourselves from what we have to do, what we must do, what we shall and shall not do, the first is to will ourselves out of that. It's what we talked about last time, is turning things from the, to what is pressed on me from outside into, well, what do I want to do? What do I will? And then the final step is into play. And the biggest place we struggle with this is I think, in our culture at least, is with work. Because we're just obsessed with work. We're driven to work. We work a lot, by the way. As a a culture, on average, we work a lot of hours. We don't take a lot of vacation time. People tend to be very stressed. Lack of sleep. Unhealthy diets. Lack of exercise. Because we have to work. Why can't it just be play? And again, it's not necessarily doing anything differently it's just understanding that it is in fact supposed to be your play a form of your self-expression that intermingles joy and opportunity and challenge and frustration sometimes overcoming difficulties but for fun for your own entertainment this is it's an incredibly different um, view of, of how the world can be without changing anything, right? Notice this is why it's transvaluation of all values. Values are the, what we put on the world. We create the values. They don't exist in the world. They don't grow on trees. 
A, a friend of mine was interviewed by a CNN Time Warner to be one of their vice presidents in charge of media. And they brought him in and they said, uh, yeah, why do you want to be a vice president here at CNN? And he said, mm, you asked me to come in. And they're like, oh, well, why might you want to be a vice president? He says, I don't know, might be fun. He did not get the job. <laughs> he was not trying that hard to get the job, by the way. <laughs> but, but, you know, that, that, but see, that's the, we know that's the wrong answer. If you're in an interview and someone says, why do you want this job? And you say, it might be fun. Like, well, not, well, hey, sure, maybe. What do you bring to the job? A sense of playfulness and a willingness to steal shit from work. You can write these down if you find them helpful, right? This is a how to get a job guide. Uh, you know, that, that's right. What, what's going on? Conversely, I've been reading about Miles Davis a lot lately. And one of the things musician after musician after musician talked about is that Miles kept telling them, look, you are here to mess around. I don't want you practicing this music on your own. I don't want you coming in knowing what you're doing. I don't want you to have something ready. I want you up on stage with me playing. Because that's where greatness comes from. If we're going to get anything great done, it's going to come from there. I mean, these are all phenomenal musicians. They kind of know what they're doing, and then Miles would just pull the rug out from under them and say, no, we're going to do something else. We're going to do something fun. We're going to play. We're going to push the boundaries out. And sometimes they would fall off. Right? Shit would go wrong. Miles is like, okay. But if you're not really playing, if you're not really out there exploring and growing and enjoying yourself, yeah, well, he fired you immediately. He's just like, okay, you're not helping. Go away. He got fired for not playing. This made him an incredibly productive and influential person, but we think of it the other way around. I hate all this stories and music and sports, but we emphasize the suffering part of this, right? Music is not about joy and self-expression and group coherence and exploration of the possibility of the human soul. No, it's suffering and practice and drudgery and grilling and ah, right? It's, it's, it's madness. Even, even in things that we think of that look to be fun, we want to say, oh, no. And musicians feel like they have to say this, by the way. Oh, well, it's a lot of work. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's really... I'm, I, it's, I think 90% of the time they're lying. <laughs> I mean, it's not that they haven't put in hours. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of hours at you. But if you love the piano, then you want to be with your piano. And what you're doing is you're saying, oh, I have to practice, which is to say, I don't want to deal with all this other shit in my life. What I want to do is go spend some lovely time with my piano, because I love my piano. They, they asked Picasso, they said, why, why do you paint so much? And he says, I love the smell of paint. <laughs> and, I, and the evidence is this was true. I think all the evidence suggests he really did love the smell of paint. What do you want to do? I want to paint. Why? Because I want to. Why else is there? What, what, what possible? I mean, because you can get up in the morning and you just paint all day. Holy shit, what a dream. You can get up in the morning and you do all kinds of things. I mean, it's a huge world. We have all this opportunity. And even when we are doing what more or less we would like to do, we say, I have to go to the coffee shop. <laughs> what? That's just madness. And yet, there we are. Um, but... That, again, that introduces a sense of poison, of resentment. And part of this is the, the wanting everything. The, the wanting the perfection, which I think is a poison, but there's also the wanting everything. And this is one of the strange problems here. No matter what you're doing, you're not doing an infinite number of other things. If you think about all the things you could be doing, and how they could be better than what you are doing, absolutely, you're doomed. Because the power of the human mind to create fantasy is, is impressive. I think it's a wonderful faculty, but it often leads us down these rabbit holes. 
Oh, I could be doing something better. Yeah, you could be. But don't you want to be doing what you are now? If not, stop doing it and do the other thing. But be careful. Because when you're doing that other thing, you can think again, oh, I would really like to be doing something else. And then you can think, oh, right, you can see where this is, this endless track. Well, then, well, what do you really want to do? Remembering, and this is what I think freezes us often, is that when you decide you want to do anything, you're deciding not to do literally an infinite number of other things. I could build a car, I could learn a language, I could go for a long walk, I could throw rocks in the pond, I could climb a tree, I could read a book. You know? Ah. What, one way I like to think about this to try and address the, both the resentment, to get that out of there, to get that poison out of there, is to ask myself, what are the actual trade-offs that I'm making? So it was just finals week. And so one of the trade-offs you make during finals week is you have to grade a hell of a lot of papers, 600 pages in my case. So this is evil, by the way, if you're, if you're wondering. It's an evil, evil process, and it makes me hate students, which is good. Uh, but, but the thing is, this only comes around once a quarter. Three times a year if you're on the quarter system, twice a year if you're on the semester system. Now, some, I think, instructors have chosen to use the multiple choice Scantron test to get around this problem. That is, that is a type of resentment, by the way. This, this is a type of, of, I don't want to do my job because it's boring and has an evil component to it, so I'll get a machine to cheat my students for me. It's pretty much like being one of the Waltons. You're just staking, you're taking the opportunity for them to learn from them because you're lazy. Uh, but... The idea is that, yes, this is not the most fun part of the job, but it's a necessary component of doing a good job. And if a job is worth doing, it's worth doing well. I think one of the ways we poison ourselves is by doing things unwell. We feel unsatisfied because we're filled with resentment, and so we do something half-ass. Where's the joy in that? If we get it done, we can go, well, I did that half-ass thing, and it's done. Oh, well, that's great. And if we don't get it done, well, geez, I can't even do a half-assed thing. <laughs> See, we build these little traps for ourselves. Because we don't want to just go, oh, if 90% of some process or job is great and 10% is I don't really like, that's a pretty good trade-off in this world of imperfect humanity. <laughs> and I can't think of anything talking to anybody who there is you know, some aspect of what they like to do doesn't sort of irritate them. My friend Jim Ball, he stopped carving wood. He's a brilliant master carver. He switched to painting, but he's a brilliant, I think he was a better sculptor than he was a painter. And he lived as a professional painter for decades. And I said, why on earth did you stop carving? You're just beautiful, beautiful sculptures, human heads, just lovely. And he said, I hated sharpening the tools. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he said, yeah, it's the most irritating thing in the world is having to sharpen those damn knives all the time. And if you didn't sharpen them, you'd be working away and it would check the wood and you'd get a big gouge and they're like, oh, shit, now I got to go. Uh, so I just switched to paint. And, and I just thought that, I was like, oh, but, oh, okay, good for him, fine. But you know, everything, I think, is going to have that little aspect of, oh, now I have to sharpen the knives. Or, uh, you know, if you love to cook and work in the kitchen, maybe you don't love to clean, right? You're like, okay, that was great. There's a big party. We've all had this big party. Woo, fun, and you're a little tipsy, and it's late, and you walk in your kitchen, and you go, oh, my goodness. Time to move, uh, right? That's just sort of, uh, uh, you know, but, but, but recognizing that, oh, this is part of it. It's not like a shock that having 20 people over at your house generates a fair number of dishes. It's just an is. And so you can go, ah, either, hey, this is part of it. That's great. That's not the greatest part of it. But hey, that's fine. I embrace it. It's the process. Fine. Or you just go, I don't want people over anymore. Neither is a wrong answer, by the way. What's wrong is to be shocked that there's dishes and go, oh my God, I can't believe there's dishes and I've got to clean this mess up. And whoa. it's like, whoa, no, wait, woo -hoo, time out. Who invited the people over? Did they like invade your house? Sometimes it feels that way, of course, uh, but, but no, right? So that, but that, see, that's how quickly we're able to take the resentment in. And again, this is just a self-poison. 
And, and the way to work against this, particularly in the situation with work, is to say, you know, does this really bother me? Is it necessary? Is there a way I can transform this into something that's much more pleasing? Can I simply avoid it? Will it go away? I once didn't answer my campus email for two and a half years. And then I got in trouble. But it's amazing, for two and a half years you could go without answering your email before you got in trouble. <laughs> it lets you know that it's really not that important. Mm -hmm. Right? And so just let it go. Woo, be free. Uh, you know, the, these sorts of, of elements of just saying, where are the real, what's really vital? Mm -hmm. Vital for them, vital contribute, and vital for you. And how do you negotiate that? And if there's no way to negotiate that, well, you need to be someplace else. My dissertation director, a brilliant woman, Dr. Diane Elam, when, when I was first getting ready to go look for jobs, she said, remember, remember, you are interviewing them. You don't want to be someplace you don't want to be. Now that sounds obvious. And at the time I thought, that's an obvious <laughs> phrase. Now I realize that, no, this is incredible insight. You don't want to be someplace you don't want to be is extraordinarily true <laughs> and yet really, really not well processed, I would say. People do not act this way. Behaviorally, if you track people, they seem to be a lot of places that they don't want to be doing things that they don't want to do which is odd. Well, we must have all gotten some job where we were very excited when we got the job, and then shortly thereafter, we were very much less excited. And, and, and what this shows is that we have a low capacity for this, right? That the way we're measuring our work and our interface with our work is not necessarily that great. Uh, by the way, all the surveys show by far the single greatest determinant of people's happiness in their workplace is how much they enjoy their colleagues. People like to work places where they like the people that they spend their time with. One hand, not shy. I know, this doesn't seem like it would be a mind-blowing revelation, but ask yourself, this isn't part generally of an interview process. Hey, who am I going to be working with? Are they fun? Will I enjoy them? Are they my kind of people? That's, that is, you know, these don't, can I meet the people that I'm going to work with? Do they seem like the kind of people I'm going to want to work with? What kind of workplace do you have? Think of, I mean, it, it, it seems the most obvious thing, but you don't get to do this. No, we're interviewing you. We're going to tell you what division you have, where your office is, and who you'll work with. Well, well what if you tell me to work with people I don't like? What if I'm working with people who don't like me? And that's going to make work unpleasant to go in every day. People do this, by the way, unbelievably. They go into where somebody doesn't like them every day and try to interact with these people. And it turns out no one feels good about this. So it's not pay, it's not status, it's not a corner office. What people really like their jobs when they like the people they work with, and they really hate their jobs when they don't like the people they work with, regardless of the job. And so, you know, this is, this is one thing to, to look at, to say, what kind of people do you want to work with? Who do you want to spend your days with? <coughs> And, and do these people that you see in that sort of businessy industry area specialty location seem like those kind of people? If yes, it probably doesn't matter what job they offer you. It certainly doesn't matter how much they pay you. You'll be much happier with work if you do like the people. So you should probably just take that job because those people are going to be great. We're going to have fun. Conversely, if you look at those people and go, ooh, what, I mean, are they, ooh. They, similarly, it probably doesn't matter what the job is, how much they pay you, what your opportunities are, you're not going to like it. Because you're spending time with people you don't like and who don't like you. Seems obvious, but it's difficult to get through our minds. 
Because one, we like to think everybody's going to like us. Uh, statistically, this is highly unlikely, by the way. Um, and the other side is we tend to focus on all those other elements, like pay and status and chance for promotion and all these other things that look good on paper, but you don't live there. And so it's hard to have a sense of play when none of the people in your office want to play with you. They don't feel like they're all playing the same game. And so we struggle with that, and again, we build up the resentment. Um, and this just makes us feel evil. And, and again, to return, doing nothing is not the converse of this. Doing something joyfully is the converse of this. Doing something that you feel evil and stressed about versus something that you feel joyful, that even if you're tired, feel, fills you with energy. Or you get up in the morning and go, wow, I can't wait to get to work. I've got this great project to work on. Or these interesting people to talk to. Or this challenge that I have that I'm looking to overcome. Or I really feel like I could improve myself. I could do better today at work than I did yesterday. That's, those are human, very strong, powerful human desires. And again, because we're communal beings, generally we don't want to be isolated. Some people do. Um, but mostly we want to work communally, then, then those structures really matter to us. But we tend not to rate them all that highly. And by the way, I think this is one of the things that's happening with this, the Me Too generation and all the stuff that's going on. This is not just a, a sexual harassment in the workplace issue. As people's attitudes towards work change, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the series, the series is not, I'm not like going, oh, transvaluation of all values, people should follow what I'm saying. I'm saying transvaluation of all values, this is happening. Our values are changing quite fundamentally um, and that bears thinking about. But one of the things that's happening is, is, is younger people um, and older people who are, who are coming back into the workforce are going, you know what? We don't like the old system. The old system is broken. I'm not, I don't want to be in a hierarchy where you tell me you will give me a pension and a raise every three years um, and job security and I'll just do whatever the hell you tell me. Number one, those jobs are gone anyway. So there's that, that, that essentially doesn't exist in reality. How much it ever existed really was always a moderate fantasy, but people bought into it. They wanted to believe it. They wanted to go with it. The lifetime union job, the, I'm a career man, I'm at IBM, I'm at General Motors, right? That sort of concept, well, all that social contract, to the extent that existed, has been shattered, blown up. We all know this, right? That, that, that notion is just gone. Anybody can be fired at any time. And so then how do you reevaluate your relationship to work if it's not at least some sense of stability and hierarchy, which people tend to love, by the way? A better way, I would argue, is to evaluate based on this notion of play, of joy, of fun, of enrichment. Now, this doesn't mean, oh, you're going to be some high-flying person who's a director, or I don't know what, a, the head of a company, although it might, if that's your thing, it might. But it also might just simply be, oh, I like to work at a team. I work at a restaurant with great people who make really good food, people like it. What could be better than that? to deliver quality people, to, 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 to fund people, and enjoy it as we do it. I mean, that it could just that simple. People like this, by the way. People like to go to nice restaurants where people are enjoying themselves. And, and conversely, it's fun to work at nice restaurants where people come in and enjoy themselves. It's a whole communal feedback thing. It's not that complicated. It's not like a huge earth shattering, but that notion that of making it fun, making it playful, changes the dynamic. To say, oh, what we're really worried about is, is everybody enjoying themselves and sort of mutual compromise, everything that has to happen. If no, well, shit's got to change. By the way, most of these places that I've been in, one rule that they have is if you're an unpleasant customer, they simply throw you out. They will not deal with you. You are not boss. Customer is not boss. See, the customer is always right. See, that is the slave mentality. What that says is your money, 
buys your rightness for a finite amount of time and in this interaction. No, no, no. No. Your money allows you to participate, but you also have to be a pleasant or at least passably decent human being, or we'll just get rid of you. We're not here to serve you. We're here to enjoy ourselves together. The customer is part of it. it eats the food. We have somebody to serve. Yay. But you're not the only part of it and not the most important part. That's an entire change of, of, of attitude. And by the way, it, it upsets us when we encounter this. I've seen people have this happen to them. Because the rule is, I have to slave someplace. And then I get money, and I can take that money and make you slave for a finite amount of time. If you don't believe this, ask anybody who works in the hospitality or service industry. I have made my money by slaving, so I am small. And so I'm now going to take that money and make you feel small so I feel big about myself. And then you have to take the money, making yourself feel small, so you can go someplace else, make somebody else feel small. And this just cycle of slavery. If you break that, people are horrified. Horrified. Tim, who used to work at the Tyler Street, who is a bit temperamental, but a brilliant, brilliant chef. Some people came in, and I never have learned what they actually said, but they said something to the, to the barista behind the counter. And he grabbed, I don't know how much money, out of the tip jar and threw it at them and said, get the hell out. If you ever step back in here again, I will call the police. And there were just these sort of well-dressed, wealthy-looking tourists who had made one complaint too many, and that was it. And they were horrified. I mean, they the look on their face like, you can't do that. Don't you understand? We gave you $10. Now you have to sit there and listen to our shit. Because if you don't, the entire system crumbles. The edifice of Western civilization will collapse. And, and it's a joke. I mean, that's not a joke. I saw that. That was true. And I've seen it more than one time. You were in the restaurant. I was in the restaurant when this happened. When it was a coffee shop, I was always there. So it was just so you know, I was a permanent, permanent fixture. Was this Tyler Street? Tyler Street, yeah. When it was Tyler Street, yeah. Now it's changed, but yes, yeah. But, but um, it's only half a joke because it really does threaten the whole system. Because now it means that money is not the primary arbiter of our interactions. It means you have to bring something as a human being that transforms it. And that is really, truly a threat. It truly shakes people. Because it's like, oh, wait a second. Now, but I have money. Right? That, that's what we want to say. Because I've slaved for it. And here we go back in the cycle. And so breaking this resentment out. And I, and I want to start with play, not work, as part of the slave mind. Um, and the next lecture, but I think this is a subset of, of what the next lecture is. The next lecture is uh, joy, not fear. And I think that is simply the expansion of this concept of the slave mind. Because the core of the slave mind, the core of what keeps us down, is this nascent fear. And I want to talk about fear a lot, and talk about joy a lot, obviously. But to put it specifically in the context of work, is we are terrified, for some reason, of being fired. Now, being fired is no fun, I imagine, unless it is good to be fired. Uh, maybe you've been fired from a job, and like a minute later, you're like, oh, that was great. <laughs> There's a job that I needed firing from, right? The, the great, great liberation of firing. And maybe just the recognition that it was well-deserved, right? Yeah, they should have fired me. And the clarity of that, of the world actually lining up and going, how is it these people cannot have fired me? What is wrong with them? And then the clarity that they fired me, well, that puts order, right? Sense back in the universe. You're like, oh, I can feel there is some logic to all this because certainly they would have fired me by now. Right, that, there's that part of it, but also just deliberating yourself from a situation in which you didn't want to be. Um, 
Now, sometimes it's painful to get fired because it forces change upon us. So the only thing worse than having a job is looking for a job. Right? There's the, this, this concept of this awful, because then again, you feel like you have your hat in your hand. I got to go around and see again, that, that's that slaveness. No, 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 it's an opportunity. If you lose a job, you just gained an infinite amount of opportunity because you were working one job and not an infinite number of them. The chances that you will not be able to find a different and better job, statistically, are unbelievably small. Because you just opened up a vast possibility that you weren't seeing because, of course, you weren't looking for a job because you had a job. And that, just to get that mindset that it is a possibility, not an end. And it's easy also to say, by the way, um, that, oh yeah, you have a lot of opportunity if you're not poor, if you're someplace that has, you know, resources, if you, 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 you have education, all these opportunities. In part, yes, that's absolutely true. Um, the flip side of this, though, is freedom not being a slave does not mean bad shit doesn't happen to you. <clears throat> this, this is the key. Bad shit happens to you whether you're a slave or not. It's the human condition. Freeing yourself up from that improves your odds tremendously. <clears throat> if you're in a situation where you say, wow, my community, I want to stay here for all these reasons. There's only one decent place to work and I work there and it has all these problems. Well, articulate that to yourself and say, well, I know why I'm doing this and it's good. Or, no, it's actually not worth it. I'm not going to do it anymore. But at least you can articulate it. There's a liberation in that. Because you don't have to pretend like you're a slave anymore. You know why you're doing it. It's your choice. You're choosing. You make it. You give it its value again. Your employer doesn't. Your workplace doesn't give you the value. You give it the value. And then you put the value on you. You make it meaningful. And then you can set the rules. And you'll know, well, now they've crossed a line where it's not meaningful anymore. It's insufficiently valuable for me and my time. And then, boom, you're free. You're in control. And it's extraordinary how liberating it is to feel just that sense of control, of knowing I don't have to do it. I can leave when I want there. Even if I don't take it, it's a huge transformation of the values that we put on all kinds of things. I'm no longer being oppressed. I'm no longer being forced. It's my choice, my power, my opportunity. And it doesn't matter where you are or what condition, that applies. Maybe more difficult to achieve in various places, but the difficulty of it is just a human condition. We don't make it. It's an imperfect world, as I keep saying. You may have noticed this occasionally. 